them have a cellular telephone? I'm just curious. Can I get a raise of hands, please? Just cellular telephone owners and users in this room? Come on, there's got to be more than that. Raise your fucking hands, you lazy <laughs> bastards. Come on. Raise your hands. Cell phone owners. Come on, we got more than that. All right, well, apparently there's only five people in this room who could do our job. <laughs> All right. I guess we should just go home. Yeah. How many people in this room have a computer? Let's try that. Okay. All right. Now, those of you who do not have a cellular phone, lower your hands. Oh, shit. Too fast for me. All right. Anybody here who's not working for the National Security Agency, raise your hand. See, now, the NSA guys are kind of slow. Sometimes they don't pick up on that one. They leave their hands down, and they go like, what did he say? You could pick them out, like, right away. So who saw the helicopter flying overhead yesterday? Anybody here? Anybody see that helicopter? We got some pictures of it. Kind of interesting. It says search and rescue or SAR on the side, but like we're trying to figure out why a U.S. military Bell Huey chopper is doing search and rescue whatever over this particular area. <laughs> so get a fucking clue. All right. So the reason we're here is to talk to you uh, today, um, and I'm going to introduce myself in a minute, but right now it's better that you shouldn't know who I am. Um, uh, we're going to talk today about how to have a career in uh, cypherpunking or hacking or whatever really, you know, makes your f boat float. Um, I was kind of serious when I said whoever has a phone like this can do my job because, you know, I'm not really that smart or anything. I've just been doing this a while. So uh, you learn a few things over the years. Uh, some of you people are young. That's cool. I like that. I was young once. <laughs> Yeah, I really was. You can't tell right now, but I was. There was. I looked at a picture of myself when I was 20 years old uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was going, man, I thought I was fat then. <laughs> All right, so uh, how many people here have find it useful to have money? <laughs> There's some really fucking lazy people in this room, because I saw like four of you motherfuckers that didn't even raise your hands. All right. Somebody bring me a space cake. We'll be having some fun here in a minute. Where's Gilmore? Hey, Gilmore, get in here if, you're, if you can hear the sound of my voice. Gilmore, Gilmore, come in, please. Literally. <laughs> All right, so uh, let me introduce myself and my illustrious cohorts uh, here, and we'll probably have some other fellows join us later. Yeah, we're in the uh, workshop tent, and there's like, uh, what, like 300 people here listening to us right now, so um, you come on over anytime. It's, it's convenient, really. We're just getting started, and we're not saying anything particularly important yet. Okay, so how to make lots of money doing crypto. <laughs> so, all right, so my name is Dave Del Tordo. Uh, I work for Deloitte & Touche. You may have heard of it. It's about 90,000 people around the world. We do uh, professional services, that sort of thing. That's my day job. That's the one that makes this phone ring. Actually, it's the one that make it, makes it light up at all. Uh, my, to my right and your left is Samir Parekh. He's uh, like one of the dudes at Securify, which is Tahir El Gamal's new company. He could tell you about that. He's also the guy who started C2Net, and before that worked on the original Anonymizer. Uh, he's a cypherpunk from way back when he was even younger than he is now, which is Damn old. fucking embryo when he started this stuff. <laughs> Over there uh, to our right is Adam Shostak. What are you now, like chief technical president of the universe at Netect or Netect? Or? No, actually, I'm oh, he's a, got a new company. What's, that? What's the new one? Zero Knowledge. Oh, he's at Zero Knowledge now. See, it's, it's like this shit happens every day. <laughs> like one day he's working for one company, and now he's working for another cool company. Uh, somewhere on the premises, we also have Ian Goldberg, who is the chief scientist at, at, out. at Zero Knowledge. He's passed <laughs> out right now. I should love these kind of gatherings. Uh, we're very informal. We're sorry, by the way, to keep you waiting. We didn't really even have any awareness that this was going on right at this moment in time. So uh, just forgive us for just wandering over here and starting. Um, I don't even know what time it is or how long we're supposed to go, so we're just going to get started here. Uh, I'll say a couple of words about uh, how to make money doing responsible hacking and cypherpunking, and then I'll give it over to Samir and, and uh, Adam, and they can talk about it. By then, we'll have some more people joining us. They'll make their comments. Then we'll just do like a big free-for-all question and answer session, because some of you guys may be interested in how PGP Inc. was started. I know a little bit about that. Um, Adam knows all kinds of stuff about the Boston scene, where MIT is, which is, I think, where the word hacking was invented. 
uh, and Samir and I are West Coast guys. We work in Silicon Valley, essentially. Of course, we work all over the place. Now, we're working here right now, as a matter of fact. How many people would like to have that job? <laughs> <laughs> Still only one guy raising his hands. What can I say, man? All right. So uh, uh, this is what I did, right? Uh, I volunteered my time quite a bit for about eight years. Um, and as a result of that, got to be in some of the companies that started up, like PGP Incorporated. Eventually, I got to be uh, a very, very important sounding title at Network Associates, which I then um, threw back in their faces and left uh, for various reasons having to do with integrity. And I then uh, signed on with this Deloitte & Touche operation, which uh, for me is actually a pretty good deal. I'm uh, the director of technology for the security services group, which is the cryptography research group. And um, it's, it's a great job. You can have a job like this too. Um, if I had wanted to write my favorite job, this would have been pretty much how I would have written it. So it is possible to find out there a job that sounds exactly like your favorite job, whatever you want to be doing for money. Um, I won't go into why it's nice to have money. I don't have like huge amounts of money like some people here, but you know, I have enough to get me here and all that stuff, so uh, that's cool for me. Um, and I have enough to basically donate money so that I can uh, do this uh, Crypto Rights Foundation thing, which Samir is also involved in, by the way. He's, uh, he's like the uh, the number two guy, I guess. Or the number one guy, if I'm number zero guy. <laughs> that makes you feel good, I don't know. Anyway, he does as much as I do, which is to say that we put a, you know, a little bit of our free time effort into trying to do technical security work for human rights groups, which is kind of cool. And actually, because I wrote my job, uh, my job likes that idea that I do that in my spare time, uh, which is okay by me. So... Uh, what I'm uh, getting at here is that uh, you need to volunteer your time in the direction in which you want to go. That's an excellent way of doing things in this world, particularly in the internet community where there's a lot of interconnected uh, you know, communities and work groups like we have represented here. I don't know how many of you guys arrived with each other kind of thing or who's like just straggling in all by themselves, but there's obviously little groups of people who know each other and this is a very cool thing that we should all meet in one place. Um, that happens, you know, at a million uh, times a second on the internet and uh, that is how you get to know the people who will eventually start companies, run companies or work at companies where you can make money doing your favorite thing. And if you're out there building reputation capital, which is a very investable thing on the internet, then uh, you will have at some point a chance in the non-virtual world to, uh, to collect a salary. And that's an actually a really cool thing because as I said, you can then do things with your salary uh, that have further, you know, cascading effects on the, on the rest of the world. So that's my two cents for now. I'll just pass it over to Samir and he can say something about this and Adam, whatever, you guys pick. Okay, so I suppose the, uh, let's see. Here. Somebody bring us some water at some point if anybody has any handy or something like that. We don't know what's been put in it, so that may be a good thing. Who knows? We have a partially drunk beer. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, so um, the way I've been trying to make money has been through starting companies doing. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah, that'd be great. You're the man. I've been starting companies doing interesting things that need to be done, and um, I suppose I'll talk briefly about. Some of what I did and some of what I've learned, I've got, you know, three, what is it, five years worth of stories, so I can't tell them all today, um, but a few of them are pretty, um, are pretty valuable, so if you're interested in starting your own company and you have questions, you can ask them, or maybe one of the brief stories I tell you today will be useful. So, where should I start? Well, uh, just want to say, we will be having, like, ongoing workshops in the Cypherpunks and the Crypto Rights Tent on stuff like this. So if you don't think of your question now or in the next half hour, an hour, you can come and talk to us any time, assuming we're sober, you know. <laughs> or not. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's also answer. pretty useful. <laughs> you get a really good answer. <laughs> so um, how long should I talk in uh, level minutes, of detail? Five minutes, level of detail. Discuss, uh, discuss the market cap on your current venture. The market cap on I'm my current kidding. venture? <laughs> just go, man. Just so, okay, so... Tell me about your job. Tell me what you do at your job. What do I do at my job? Yeah, like, if you do anything, I don't 
<laughs> I'd rather tell about, talk about Sony and Company because that's actually interesting. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, so in '94, it was an interesting time because I had just moved to California. I just started school. I was going to University of California at Berkeley, and I just hooked up with the Cypherpunks. So I was on the Cypherpunks mailing list, and on the Cypherpunks mailing list, it was great. People were talking about all this crap about making the internet anonymous and providing anonymous communications and making the government irrelevant and being able to provide communications for people to do civil liberties work and um, not have to pay the taxes so that the government couldn't infringe upon people's civil liberties because they don't have a tax base to spend. And a bunch of really good ideals which um, I strongly supported. And people talked about how all of the great anonymous technology which has, was basically invented in the 80s um, would be able to be used to <clears throat> provide for all of this value. But everyone was talking about all this technology that was developed in the 80s, and this was in 94. And if the technology was developed in the 80s, why wasn't it being implemented? And most of the people were like, oh, this technology is great. The magic fairies from the sky are going to come down, and they're going to give us this technology, and we're going to overthrow the government, and it will be great, and we won't have to do any work. And I knew that was pretty bogus. So I thought, well, this is bogus. I should make something happen. So I just started a company. I'm like, well, this needs to be done. I've got a little bit of money. I had like a computer my parents gave me, um, a Spoke 2, which was expensive at the time, um, and just got an internet connection and started a company. And it was all very confusing because I knew nothing about what companies company structures were, what sole proprietorships were, what taxes were, what is, <coughs> what. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, what, what, was, your, what was your name again? What's your name? Tobias? Tobias? Everybody, this is Tobias. Can you thank him, please? <laughs> this is a... <laughs> Tobias, Tobias oh, is an ex a perfect example of somebody volunteering like, oh. in the sphere in which he's interested in working. You see, now I'm going to remember the guy. If he ever yeah. wants a job later, you know, not just carrying water either. I'm sure you can do cool <laughs> stuff. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Here's my card. <laughs> it's not a get out of jail free card, but yeah. it's like go buy the fucking jail. Tell me where to stick it. So, so I started implementing a bunch of anonymous services, but it turned out that people really didn't want to pay for the anonymous services I had to provide. Um, a bunch of people were using them, and it was really cool and valuable, but. I ended up coming up with a, with a product, um, which was actually a software product that I could sell and people would pay a thousand bucks for it, rather than a wait, service. Wait, wait. Let's let's just pause there and just. Okay. What year was that again? That was like 1995, which one? 96. When I came out with Stronghold. Yeah. No, yeah, it was 96. Yeah. Early so 96. So like 96. So think about that, folks. That's a thousand dollars in 1996 dollars. That's what like. A thousand fifteen. That's that's like a Vio. <laughs> that's a Vio laptop these days, right? Per per like item, right? Yeah, per piece of, per bit of software. So, um, the product, well, okay, so my company was basically an internet provider. It had all these privacy features on top of it, but it was basically just an internet provider. You can get an account, you just didn't have to tell me who you were, you could pay anonymously, all sorts of things like that. Um, so, I had at my site a web server, and I was using Apache, which was the most popular web server at the time, like, I'll just go with the flow, I'll use whatever's the most popular. But in uh, that's cool. Let him cry. Let him cry. That's cool. Yeah. Well, I'll skip that story. Um, <laughs> well, no. So there was a story that I was considering to tell. I'll tell that later. Um, but anyway, so the product added um, cryptography to Apache, which is a web server, um, which is the most popular web server in use on the internet. And the product's name was Stronghold. At the time, all it did was add cryptography. Um, a bunch of licensing and a bunch of um, necessary business arrangements that needed to be done in order to make the product useful. I think it's I worth noting I guess that's actually here. an interesting story because I, yeah, this is this the, is worth um, this is worth noting the that value chose a that I created in selling this in, in this product was 100% non-technical. It's kind of funny because today a lot of people come up to me and they act like I'm a technical person. And yeah, I have a technical background. I did CS in school and stuff, but I bailed on that after just a year and a half. Um, so what I did, all I did was take a bunch of products that were available for free on the internet. I put them all together. I licensed some patents from RSA. I did a business deal with VeriSign. 
and I had a product that I could sell for a thousand bucks. And Can we talk about that licensing deal a little bit? So the margin on that was pretty good because I didn't do any work putting it together on a technical perspective. All I did was do all the business end. In other words, and the way business to get the end was a lot of, of work, but it's not something a rocket scientist needs to do. It's just something you need to put your mind to doing and you do it and then it's done and then you can start making money off of it. So, so in early 96, I came out with this product. At the time, I was only charging 500 bucks a copy. I wasn't charging 1,000 bucks. Um, and started selling the product and that actually started making money. So I knew that the right thing to do was to follow the money. So I, I moved away from the privacy services business into this encryption software business. Now one of the interesting things I learned with respect to the pricing issue is that the first edition of the product was only $500. And I had all sorts of customers, I was doing great, but a lot of the customers I had were really annoying. They would call up on the phone and they'd ask for support. us to hold their hand. And Well, people would always ask for support and we'd give them support because that's one of the very important values we nice. give to them. But the $500 customer was the kind of customer that wants everything for free. They'd pay you their 500 bucks, but they'd call you up and they'd want hours and hours of phone support for free just because they gave you their 500 bucks. It's like for 500 bucks, that doesn't get you a whole lot of support. Maybe it'll get you an hour or an hour and a half of an engineer, but not, not the five to 10 hours people want an engineer hand holding them while they're installing it. But so these $500 <clears throat> a pop customers would call us up and complain and harass and we wouldn't, we couldn't afford to give them that level of support, so we wouldn't, but we'd still have our receptionists and our sales staff always having to be nice to them, because they're our customers, so we still have to be nice to them. But, but then when we came out with the second version of the product, we made the price a thousand bucks. When we raised the price to a thousand bucks, our customers became so much nicer. We call this, we have a phrase They for wanted the less States. for the thousand bucks, for the twice that they paid. We yeah, call, we had we a bunch this, of people who had been paying 500 bucks before and got upset that we raised the price to a thousand bucks. It's called separating the men from the boys. The exactly. Business. And one of the really important things that I learned is not just that people who pay more are willing, um, expect less, but people who pay, people who have a brain want your business to survive. Because if someone is buying a product from you, and you're charging them 10 bucks. And then they think, these guys must be losing money charging 10 bucks. They're not going to be around another year charging 10 bucks ahead for their product. Then, even though you're undercutting the competition and your product's better than all the rest, if your customer doesn't think you can make money by selling product to them, they're not going to buy products from you because they know you're not going to be around in a year because you'll have gone out of business. So, so customers who pay a higher price per unit then seem to have more interest in your success. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. They have more interest in your success and they generally have more intelligence about it because it's important for customers to be interested in their vendor's success. The $500 a unit customers we had were not interested in our success. They just wanted to harass us and get stuff from us for free and they didn't end up <clears throat> getting a whole lot. When we raised the price to a thousand bucks, they stopped buying. Our sales ended up going up, of course, but those customers specifically stopped buying and they didn't get the value that <clears throat> we had to offer to them. So. That was a very important lesson. Um, so you go on to Adam? Say. Sure. How many people here? How many people here still smears mic? <laughs> so I'm How curious. How many people here have a microphone that works? <laughs> How many people here would consider themselves not a brilliant programmer? Someone who would, you know people who are better programmers than you. <laughs> okay, okay, now, now I'm in this category and I am, I'm about to start working for Zero Knowledge doing product design, product direction, and designing the freedom services and the anonymity services that hopefully all of you will be using. I think this is really cool. I've been involved with cypherpunks for eight or nine years now. I think privacy is incredibly important and someone's gonna pay me to do it. I think that is just so cool. And by the way, can I just ask how many people here wanted his job? <laughs> you can be honest, you know, you can be honest. Oh, that's bullshit. <laughs> no, how many seriously, people, that is bullshit because Yeah, this is something I've job. wanted to do for eight years, and someone is going to pay me to spend my time doing it. How many people would like to get paid to do something they've wanted to do for the last ten years? 
Okay, thank you. So, the, John? The, the question is, how do you get there? How do you get to a point where someone will let you walk in the door, tell them what the job you want to do is, explain to them why you should be paid to do it, and make this all come together? And a lot of it comes from the reputation stuff that, that Dave and Samir have been talking about. Reputation is really important. If you have the reputation, you can go to a conference and meet someone and they'll say, oh, I've talked to you online or I've read some of your stuff. And that's a really useful thing because it gets past some of the initial, well, why are we talking with you sort of thing that can happen because time's limited. So reputation is really valuable. The other thing that's a really valuable thing to develop is an understanding of how your pointy haired bosses think. You don't need to think this way yourself. You need to understand how they think. And you laugh because it, it feels dumb, but you know, if you want the job where they will pay you to do what you want to do, you have to know how to explain to them why it's a good idea for them to pay you. If you can't do that, you're not going to get the job. So, Uh, uh, Actually, I disagree, but yeah. I'll talk about it later. Uh, I mean, that, that's kind of why we're here. We're, we're here to prove to you that you can actually be like a little pointy-haired boss yourself and have a tremendous effect on things. Cause, like John, John here is really a, a pointy-haired boss, but you can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, He's like the coolest pointy-haired boss on the planet, probably, and you can't tell. No, okay, no, 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 so, I'm not talking so, about looks. So, I'm talking about what he does. Dave, can, can I? Yeah, go, go. Sure. Um, the thing that I think would be really important and very good is if people can get on the internet and do things on the internet and in real life in a private fashion where it's not possible to link the internet persona to the persona in the real world. I think that would be a fantastic thing to have happen. And we can talk about why that would be a fantastic thing. But if you take for a minute that I believe that, then what we need to do is find somebody who can figure out how to make money doing that, right? And if we can find some way to make money doing that, then I can do what I want to do. Do, do you see what I'm saying here? Yeah. Yeah, well, in, this, in my case, somebody else figured out how to make money. Five years ago, I sat down and spent three months trying to figure out a way to make money, very similar to what Samir was doing and not being able to make money. I tried to figure it out, didn't find the answer. Somebody else figured out the answer, and then I went to them and said, let's give me a job. So this, this was made easier, just a sec. This was made easier by the fact that I had developed over the last years reputation capital, knew some of the people who were involved already, and could go to them and say, look, you know me, let's, let's have a serious conversation. So I have another question over here. <laughs> well, ah, yeah. but that person can recommend you. Yes, that, that person can recommend you. You can choose to reveal that that identity is your identity um, if you're willing to do that. There are a number of cypherpunks who for a long time have used fake names, who've gone under various names on the list, Black Unicorn, Lucky Green. Is Lucky here? Lucky is not around, and we're not going to point him out because he may use his real name at the conference, and we don't want to tie those together for him. But there are cypherpunks who, like Lucky, who I now know in the real world, and I'm not going to tell you his real name, but you can, you can tie those together through selective revelation, through um, making a recommendation. There's ways to get around that problem. So in a way, they're contradictory, but we can deal with those contradictions. 
So let me just finish and then I'll hand over to John by saying that the, the things that I see as key are reputation capital and an understanding of the way the business world thinks. Because with those two things, you can go out, you can raise money, you can build a business plan and get to do what you want to do. So I'm going to pass on to John Gilmore, who will describe the cool stuff he's doing. <laughs> Sorry, John. Yeah. Hello. Um, I guess I can talk a little bit about starting a free software company, which was Cygnus Solutions, and, uh, and then go back to, I actually like to talk about uh, your question or your comment. So um, Cygnus was a free software company. They maintained the GNU compiler and debugger. Uh, it was started by me, David Henkel Wallace, and Mike Tiemann uh, in 1989. And what we originally thought we were going to do was take over for the compiler departments of big companies like Sun or DEC, um, that they would just adopt the GNU compiler because it was better and we'd get the job of maintaining it and charge them a million dollars a year for it or something. No, none of them ever bought that, though. We never convinced anyone to do it. But we stumbled into a different market, which was for cross-compilers into embedded systems, where you're, you're running on a workstation or a PC or whatever, and you're compiling for a microwave oven, a networking board, or something like this. And it turns out all the tools that existed for that were being built by these small companies fairly fat and lazy. They were charging half a million dollars for a port to a new chip and $10,000 a copy for the software. So, um, so we took a piece of free software, put in the work we needed to do to make it compete with those, and then sort of blew our way into the market and said, well, we'll port it to your chip for $300,000. right? And you can give copies away to all your customers. And they thought, this was a great idea. We talked enough companies into this, Intel in the early days, um, Sun. We were doing the G++, the GNU C++ compiler for Sun for their research group that was building a whole operating system in C++. As long as you can solve somebody's problem, they don't care whether you do it with free software or with proprietary. What they care is they get their job done. And so they'll be glad to pay you the same kind of money they're paying the commercial houses, except the result goes into the free software community, and it keeps feeding back with updates and improvements from everybody else in the world. So that's, that was how I tried to combine um, making a living and also doing good for uh, software. And, and yeah, so in talking about your comment, yeah, I think it's possible to have a job and an activism life and the two are separate. It's, it's a joy if you can actually combine them. If you can't, you know, you live with what you live with. But you can help, I think you can help by using the activism side, using your, your moral sense to seek out the opportunities in the commercial world and decide which ones are good for the world and try and get jobs at those, talk to the people at those, etc. Well, sometimes, even when you start your own business, sometimes you don't have that freedom. In the United States, they passed a law about five or six, no longer than that, 10 years ago, that said that a company is not allowed to hire people unless they can prove that they're citizens of the United States. And this was to get back at people coming in from Mexico and it's clamped down on general people living there and working without permission from other, other countries. It was a bad idea, I thought. And I, I said I would never enforce that law. At the same time, I heard it's just a few years ago, they had, had to raise the, the limit for um, how much you could pay foreign citizens in the company and then get them to the US. They had to raise that limit to $90,000. 
Huh, I never yes, heard. Because you could, they couldn't find enough. Oh, foreigners, yeah, for cheap. I think that what you heard was that they raised the number of people allowed in per year to 90,000 right. people. And this year it's been raised to 200,000 people. Okay. Not the number of dollars that you can pay one of them. Okay. Yeah. On the, um, on the activism front, I think that <clears throat> from my perspective, in order to accomplish social good in the world, one actually has to do pretty big things. And one can't <clears throat> accomplish social good just by raising consciousness and telling people what's going on. One actually has to accomplish things, get things done, get products out there. And in order to do that, you need a significant amount of capital. And in order to get that capital, you need to <clears throat> start a company and make money with that company. So <clears throat> you can do things in two ways, I think. One way is to start a company whose goal it is, is to produce some product which has a very strong social good, such as the freedom product <clears throat> um, that Zero Knowledge Systems is putting out. And by getting that product out there, <clears throat> using the initial capital you have, get the product out there, build <clears throat> that product into something large, and with that accomplishment, you've then achieved a social good that you wouldn't have been able to achieve just by being active and saying privacy is a good thing that we all should have and it's all good. Um, hmm? Zero Knowledge Systems, the one Adam will be soon working for. Um, because <clears throat> if, if they succeed, then everyone on the internet will be able to have anonymity. How many people and, here have heard of uh, the Zero Knowledge Systems company? Just give us an indication. Okay, so there are a lot of people who don't know about it. Well, let's tell you a little bit about it first because it's, it's a pretty interesting thing. This is a good example of how you take Cypherpunk products and, and or Cypherpunk software and productize it in a general way. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I was at, I think this is a good idea. I want to apologize for dragging my company that I'm going to be working for in here. But I, I do believe we can use it for good examples. No, it's okay. It's, it's, it's a very good example. If you didn't think it was worth working for, you wouldn't be working. That's here. right. Yeah, it's perfectly yeah. cool. You know, a little, uh, a little plug here doesn't, doesn't you know, hurt anybody. Um, okay, so uh, there are great people to talk about the origin of the thing. I'll start off by saying that, uh, that the Zero Knowledge System software implements something they call anonymous internet protocol. And it is a combination of a couple of technologies that were developed both among the cypherpunks groups on the lists and also cypherpunks who work in government agencies like the Naval Research Lab, as well as commercial software developers who have uh, you know, products that are already out there on the market. So um, for, for example, the cypherpunk remailers started out, uh, one of the two guys with John who sort of founded the cypherpunks group in the Bay Area, and I guess it was Peninsula, San Francisco or whatever, um, was, uh, was Eric Hughes who uh, worked on the remailer software at UC Berkeley. And Eric was one of the guys who first started the cypherpunk archive at Berkeley. Um, <clears throat> and who I think still kind of maintains it, sort of. Uh, <laughs> somebody does anyway, probably Nikita knows that. Uh, anyway, um, so the, the remailers uh, were a way of sending email through uh, a chain of remailing devices, each one of which would strip the uh, header information off of the preceding message, thereby somewhat anonymizing it from everybody beyond that hop. Um, and if you chained up enough of those, you could have a reasonable guarantee of anonymity or pseudonymity at the other end. The, there were a couple of management problems in the system, uh, among them being the reliability of the remailer um, servers, uh, just the difficulties of working with SendMail, the fact that it was really more scripting than application development, stuff like that. Um, but it, it became a very useful thing for a bunch of us to use to send email to each other to, to each other anonymously or to post a list anonymously or to news groups. And that was actually a good thing in the development of the cypherpunk movement because it enabled some people to sort of rant and, and rave on, on, on lists and some people to you know, give us a really good example of their poor maturity and some people to basically out themselves or get themselves thrown in federal prison or whatever. Uh, but it's one of those disinfectant things, you know, that, that works really well, as well as being a useful way for some people to post technical information, which was very important to people in other countries, for example, without having fear of being imprisoned. So um, that was useful. Then uh, somebody at the Naval Research Lab came up with, uh, with onion routing, which is an interesting protocol for doing the same kind of thing with, with uh, HTTP packets. It was originally in intended as a way for military uh, people to be able to surf websites anonymously. Um, oh, yeah, so, actually, so, 
Yeah, go ahead. On that topic, I, I asked these guys at the annual crypto conference, they presented the onion routing idea um, of forwarding these packets around so you couldn't tell where they came from. It's like, why is the US Navy working on this and why do you want to make it free? Right? Why are you giving it to us? And they said, well, you know, we won't have anonymity out in the world unless you do. If everything is trackable on the net, you'll be able to watch us too. And somebody at AT&T uh, picked up on this and uh, came up with a marketing slogan that was very clever. It says, anonymity loves a crowd. <laughs> so, I mean, this is a really cool point that John brings up. It was this military organization that decided to free this idea out into the world so that they could benefit from it. But coincidentally, everybody else here gets to benefit from it somewhat. Now, I happen to be of the opinion that this would have happened regardless of whether Naval Research Lab participated or not, because we were already on the track. But they really, uh, you know, pushed it a little bit. And of course, immediately some people found some holes in the protocol and some people found implementation problems and stuff like that. And Adam works with one of those guys. Adam, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to, to say that the naval research guys are a great example of how you can twist your job into something that yeah. you really want to do if you can figure out a way to sell it to management. Right. These guys wanted to build a privacy tool. They said, you know, we really need to look at these other countries' military websites. We can't do it from naval sites, so we need anonymity. Gosh, we're going to create this anonymity tool and give it away to everyone. It's an Great excellent hack. hack on the it's Navy. It's an excellent hack. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> Phenomenal. Yeah. But they didn't. <laughs> right. The important thing to understand here is the guys who did this at NRL are actually cypherpunks. We know them from various meetings that we've held, and they've come and they've shared the idea that, and this is networking that I was talking about way, way in the beginning. We know these guys reasonably well enough to say, you know, the work they're doing is a very is very good evidence of where their hearts lay. So, um, you know, when John says that this is this is a you know an interesting thing for the military to do, and why did they do it? I mean, that's a perfect example of guys doing activism regardless of what their employment is, okay, which yeah. is kind of what Adam's touching on and what John's talking about as well. Let me extend that a little yeah, bit please. more and, and say mm -hmm. that, but they didn't is my flip technical answer. This, this goes back to learn how to think like your bosses. You and I understand okay. that there's other solutions available and this might not be the only way to do it. It might not be the cheapest way to do it, but if you present it correctly and sell it correctly, it gets done. But then it's about the boss, not to think like you. No, no, that's no. exactly the opposite of what he's saying. But it's, uh, if you want to make that point, it's valid, but that's exactly the opposite of what he's saying. Well, okay. What matters is you establish communication right. between you and the boss. You, you, don't, you don't care how he thinks. Get what you want. Right. You just need to know how to work within that, that system to manip I mean, has anybody here heard of a, a television show called Sergeant Bilko? It's a really old American TV show about this guy who was in the army and he could get anything done. His commanding officer came to him when there was any problem because this guy had it down. He understood the system so well that if it was a matter of like getting this huge truck or if he needed a, you know, an aircraft carrier for something. He knew who to call for the favor. He knew how to, you know, manipulate the system. He knew how to fill out the forms, whatever needed to be done. I have really I really have you do. You really have a problem. I did. You want to tell me it doesn't matter where you operate? No, that's, you're outside the military system. that's that's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying. That's I'm interesting, but it's not what I'm saying No, either. no, I, I, okay. One, <laughs> I did not contribute anything to the actions that the military did. I don't use the Naval Research Lab systems. Um, I haven't contributed code to it. I'm not doing anything for it. I'm using it as an example of how people who are working for the military are doing things that I think are useful. Now, would I suggest that everyone go out and use this military system so that they can get anonymity? No, I don't think that's a good idea. Actually, they don't have to but, because your company is going to provide a nice solution, aren't they? <laughs> Which is but, really more to the point. When someone is working for the military, and that's a choice that they've made, 
if they'd like to build technology that I find useful, like the GPS system, then I may decide to take advantage of that. I don't consider that the military per se is evil. They do some good things, they do some bad things, and we need to judge those. Yeah, it, so. it was actually the military that invented computers. It was the cryptographers trying to decode things. <laughs> okay, so. Um, <clears throat> forward on to some more bullshit. So, okay, I just want to give you some. I just want to give you some summary points here uh, that we can argue about over in the tent over there, or over in the crypto rights tent. A um, couple of things that uh, floated to the top here. One, uh, write your own job description, which is a really useful thing. Go out and volunteer in that area and network with other people who like to do what you want to do. Uh, Samir su suggested that at some point you may want to start your own company if you have the right you know, constellation of people and, and finances. Um, maybe target yourself as the first customer so you know exactly what you're trying to produce and why you're trying to produce it. Um, go out and find some customers who are like-minded. Uh, license any technology that you, you might need. Uh, find customers who will pay more because they care about the fact that you're going to survive to provide them with further services. Uh, develop reputation capital so that you can, um, you know, so you can make your way through the technical community you want to work in. Uh, learn how to think like your boss and understand how they work so you can manipulate what it is that they have to offer into something good. Um, you don't necessarily need to start your own company. You may actually find somebody who does exactly what you want to be doing and has figured out a way to sell it. Join up with them. Um, and try to solve your problems with free software. It's a really good thing to do for everybody. So those are some, some of the things that we talked about. Does anybody want to uh, talk about any of those topics? Or anything else? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so go. got a question over there. And he probably is, <laughs> which is totally cool. I, I see some of his yeah. <laughs> no, 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 let me let me just say something here. You know, don't don't necessarily take that guy down in order to convince us that you're good because you're probably good. I can tell, and and uh, that's cool. And he's probably good too. But you have something to offer for less money, and you think you can do as good a job. Right. Okay. So, so there's snake oil in reputation as, w as well as in software. That's pretty obvious. Yeah, the point is that you, uh, if, if your software is adequate, it's bad, you can't sell it. Right. I'll, I'll do your marketing. I, uh, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have an anonymizing remailer that you can send email to about that. Okay. Um, yeah, let me let me just say one thing about this. Can I just say one thing about this? And I think this is a really I mean, this is one of my philosophies. And I hope it works for you guys as well. My philosophy is that is if all my friends are getting rich, I'll be just fine. <laughs> That's really seriously. I, I've been thinking that way for a long time. You know, um, every once in a while, somebody like gives you a little money or something like that, and you think to yourself, well, what did I do to deserve that? And then you know, you think, oh well, okay. So I helped so and so make you know way more money than that, or you know whatever. The point is that it all comes around to you eventually. If you do something really bad working for the military, okay, eventually your ass is going to get kicked somehow, right? You're going to you're just going to engender that kind of karma and that's the way it is. If you don't have to work for the military, you know, you're going to fuck yourself up some other way because you're that kind of person, right? If you start thinking about the people around you and not like hacking their local network so they can't fucking connect to the gateway, <laughs> right? Then 
then, then you're probably somebody who's out there doing good work for a lot of other people, and we will find out about you, and we will help you out. You know, I mean, people come to me now, young guys, whatever, you know, older guys, doesn't matter really, and they, you know, they find out what my gig is, and they say, you know, you got any work? And I say, yeah, absolutely. Or I say, no, fuck you very much, because it's based on, you know, I don't say it right to their face, but you know, it's, this, this is a person who has not contributed at all, or a person who has zero potential to contribute, or doesn't evidence any interest in other people then it's not going to do me a lot of good to help them because it'll be like a dead end for me to put my energy into, right? But on the other hand, if it's a guy that writes a really useful tool and he starts giving it away to people free, I want this guy to get as much press and as much you know, exposure inside my company as well as to all my customers and clients as I can possibly give him. You know? I mean, guys like Adam, Samir, John, whatever they're doing. I mean, John's you know, funding essentially a free software product right now with a free swan thing. And we're going to be demonstrating that, right? Uh, ongoing during the conference, but at some point it'll be set up between the cypherpunk stent and the crypto rights stent. We'll have two ends of an IPsec tunnel you can check out. Um, oh, yeah, I think we'll have the IPsec install fest on Sunday, which Sunday means afternoon. Which means so that John bring, and Hugh will show you how to do it. Bring your <laughs> Linux machine, we'll install the IP security stuff on there, and you can set up virtual private networks among you and all your friends. Very cool. So anyway, my point exactly is that they're doing stuff like this. I mean, he's flying himself and a couple other people out here to do this thing because he's got the wherewithal because he worked inside the corporate thing at the right time and, and uh, can now do this, you know, can afford to do this. I mean, this is a very good example of somebody who puts his money where his mouth is, right? Um, so try to make sure that all your friends are doing really well. It's a really good way to do this kind of cypherpunk stuff. It really is. And free software is an excellent solution. Now. I must, I must tell you that I learned recently that the software that, that Hugh Daniel and John Gilmore have been uh, managing and, and getting people to work on all over the world is considered both by, by the ICSA and by my company where we have a lab to be the benchmark software for IPsec. That's not an insignificant fact, in case anybody Which hears. Which is pretty frightening, actually. It is pretty yeah. frightening. Yeah, I mean, what if it you means know is what's really what, going what do the rest of those guys right. have? I mean. Yeah, yeah. But this is a great example of how a free software product run by cypherpunks is raising the waters for all the boats out there doing IPsec. Because everybody is, is basically breaking their product against what they're doing. Um, OK, so yeah, more questions. Uh, anybody? Anybody have you a question, question about the technical question, perhaps? Yeah, we got one right in the middle here. He's been okay, waiting for a while. For No, no, what we said was that we don't mind using the software the military has developed to do something good. That's what we said. Yeah, but it's there not is, like. Yeah, there is another point, though. That okay. Adam. Yeah. Adam. Adam. Oh, okay, well. So, so the question is, if if the technology that we build can be used for good or evil, and also, should we take money from the military to do things? Are those sort of the questions that that you're asking? Well, well, let me let let, let me take the question of um, take building technology for money. Um, we built eight nine years ago remailers. We built some web proxies over five years ago. There's lots of privacy out there on the internet today, or the, there's lots of privacy technologies available. No one is using them because they're hard to use. So I personally think that people spending money developing better interfaces, more usable systems, is a good thing. Whoever those people are as to is military R&D money well spent? Usually not. 
It, it's usually a pile of bunk, and what we paid for GPS is way more than it's worth in all probability. But we don't control what the military spends money on. About a week ago in the New York Times, it came out that the US Air Force was spending $800 million that Congress had told them not to spend to buy a new satellite. The, the military in the United States goes off and spends money on things that it wants to spend money on. And the reason we brought them up, the reason I'm using them as an example, is because some people who were working for the military, are still are working for the military, found a way to build a useful piece of technology and make it available to people. And I think that's a good thing. Despite all of the evil things that the military does and that the police forces in the United States do, I think that having them build technology is good. Yeah, but let's yeah, not, let's not get into the rhetoric of like, you know, something done for the military justifies what the military does. It's really not relevant to this discussion. Um, question, yeah. I think that the definition of the useful. Sorry. Yeah, that's what we have well, young from, people for. From though. the definition of the useful, what a useful technology Samir, is. Samir, I think Samir, Samir. That's mm -hmm. what we have young people for is because they keep reinventing what's good and bad, okay? We're not pretending to have all the answers, you know? John's older than me. I'm older than Samir. It really doesn't matter at all how old we are at, at this point because we're just doing as much good stuff as we can do. But, yeah, eventually we'll croak, you know, and then you guys will be the guys like us sitting here or whatever, you know, in a year, five years, ten years, whatever, right? And then you'll be telling people who are still figuring out what's going on in the world, you know, where they can go to try and do something useful. And it's your personal, you know, definition of what's useful. I, I'm not going to tell you what's useful. I think it's useful if every corporate network in the world starts using digital cash. I have a lot of reasons why I think that's useful. That might, they may not coincide with your reasons. Nevertheless, I think that sort of thing is, is going to happen because a lot of people will agree that it's very useful. So in a sense, doing things that are beneficial to your friends is a way of keeping in touch with what is useful for a lot of people. It's that part about be your own customer first. Put, yeah. Build the stuff that's useful to you and spread it around and see what other people say. See that they'd say, well, this, is, this does 90% of my job. Can you just add this little bit over here? And then you go, ah, now I know what, how I can be better for the world is I put on the little 5% and it's twice as useful. How many people here are, just a really quick question, Ant, I want to ask everybody. How many of you guys here are creating software of some kind, doing an interface, uh, web form, web proxy, whatever? A anybody here doing an engineering product here? Project? Anything like that? Raise your hands. Just give us an idea of like how many here are producing things. Okay, well, cool. Well, there's, so there, there's a few people in the room here who are doing things. Does, do any of those people want to talk about what they're doing and have us discuss that, all of us? Anybody here doing a useful project? Okay, you're doing something useful. Good. Well, something I started, it's not finished yet. I'm, I'm not sure if it ever will, but uh, it fits to uh, what he said. And, uh, one of the problems of uh, especially cryptology is that people don't use it. The, the technology is there, and uh, most people here in the room could uh, encrypt things in more ways than uh, they want to think about. But the normal user just doesn't use it, and sometimes isn't even aware of it. So uh, one thing I started about <coughs> half a year ago, I think on the platform I'm playing with, uh, was the, the tool to put encryption on the mail server. PGP encryption uh, done by the mail server. Like, so, like PGP Domo? But uh, you bring it to the boss, to your boss, and he finds it unusable. 
Right. So, so this actually goes to, to what Adam, oh, something Adam was saying about, um, um, you know, not necessarily needing to start your own company, for example, or finding somebody else who already has a company that wants to sell your idea. Yeah, it doesn't. Because that, that's a way of understanding some boss somewhere or understanding some, some business person to the point where you can essentially engineer them to do something good for everybody. Okay. Yeah. It's an interesting question. Uh, do, do users appreciate uh, the tools that you give them if they're so transparent that they don't know they're even there? Um, But 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 understand something here. You you've made a really interesting point, but your your interesting point kind of contradicts your example. Um, your example is that this boss, this client, whatever, took two and a half years to figure something out, right? Yeah yeah. But but uh, the point here the point here is that two and a half years ago they didn't get it, but you did, and you tried to explain it to them, right? And I think the point that we were trying to make here a little earlier is there's no way for you to explain to these people how, why it should work the way it should work, right? There's no way for you to explain to them. They have a very narrowly set, you know, very narrowly defined set of goals, and they want that, okay? If they want that information, it's very simple for you. Just don't give it to them. Go out and find somebody else who wants to do the system the way you want to do it, okay? That can be done. So. Don't get hung up. Don't get hung up on one particular customer because you should be building a system for yourself, right? If you build it the way you want it to be done, people will come and find you and they'll say, "I'd like something that does that. Can I please buy it from you?" Yeah, but you understand that you didn't teach that customer anything. They learned it themselves. It took them two and a half years, right? Well, you may she, have had a, an helped. impact. Yeah, you had. Yeah, you helped. Ah, that's the best. That's the best one. No, I'm only kidding. That's not the best. That's the second best. But <laughs> the best one is if they really get it and they really like the way you did it. No, no, it's it's that's that's an interesting uh, uh, it's an interesting example actually. Sure. Yeah, I'll give you an example here, John. I th I think John wants to bail out. So, John, you got somewhere to go? Oh. Yeah, you I want, just you want to say bye. It's, yeah, it's turning into more of a mutual conversation. I was yeah. just going to go off the podium. And yeah, we can we can talk there. about this later. Um, I don't know when we're supposed to finish this up, but I'll just continue until they throw us out, and then we'll leave. Okay, um, but I don't want to get to your question, and I know somebody over here had something to say, and I'll just be quick here. Um, I have customers on a daily basis who want something done a particular way, and they don't understand why it should work that way, why it should work any other way, and uh, I have to educate them, you know, as best that I possibly can. That's one of the downsides of, of the job that I do, is that I do have to go out. Yeah, downside. That's one of the less good things about my job. My job has lots of good features. 
But I always have to think about you know some of the little bummers that I have. One of them is that I have to go out and talk to people. Now, here's what I've done to engineer the situation so it's, it reduces the impact on my, on my stress, and so I feel like I'm still doing what I want to be doing. I work for this big company. I, I make a phone call. If, if a customer calls me and says, uh, we're doing all this security engineering in our you know, e-commerce product, and we're not sure why you specified all these particular ciphers to be used. We think it's, you know, it's overkill, and, and uh, you know, we think DES is just fine for what we want to do, stuff like that. You know, and and uh, you know, why do you want us to do this? Because it'll cost us X, you know, ten thousand something dollars to have this engineer fix this thing, and then we got to do all this QA. And it's a real hassle, and it's it's very easy for me to fix. I have a couple of different strategies. One is I tell them, uh, as we rev your product, we will help you. We will provide an engineer to do that, and we'll send you a bill for it, so it won't feel so bad, you know. And some of them do that. You know, in other cases, we say, oh, well, that's cool, you know, no problem, but we're not going to give you the seal of approval of our particular little uh, company because we don't believe that that would be a responsible way to conduct those affairs. Now, I have the advantage of working for a 90,000-person audit company, okay? I, I, I chose my strategic location very carefully here. So you understand what my cypherpunk desire, design is on the world, right? I'm out there to try and free up a lot of software, encrypt everything, give people privacy, all that kind of stuff, promote human rights, work on things like democratic voting systems that use cryptography, etc. And the way that I do it, working for the cryptography division of a very big audit company, is that I go in with the auditors, and while we have them by the testicles, saying this is how much money you have, and we know that you're doing all this stuff, and you shouldn't be doing that, and this is illegal in this country, and all that other stuff, we say, oh, by the way, um, we won't be using DES as the cipher in your new product. And they go, oh, yeah, okay. And, and it works really well, because you've got them you know, where it counts. Um, it's a really excellent motivating factor in our, in our business relationship with all of our clients that, that, they, you know, that they find it advantageous to do things the right way. So whether you're doing that or you're selling software or you're selling professional services or you're selling engineering services, whatever. Yeah, we're going to... Okay, so we, we're going to the next question, right? So that's always true. Yeah, please. Right. So from a licensing perspective, the, the point, in my opinion, for software to exist is to serve a need. And in order to serve a need, you need to, s <clears throat> and the need that <clears throat> I tried to serve with my software was providing encrypted web communications. <clears throat> in an environment where, Just tell me, do you put a license on your, your product? Yes, all software, most. 99% of software is licensed. Free software, open software, proprietary software, shareware, freeware, there's hardly any software that's released into the public domain. It's all licensed. It depends on what kind of license you put on it. You can either have an open source license or you can have a proprietary license or whatever. Um, in my opinion, the decision about what license you put on your software depends in a large, to a large degree on the environment in which the software exists. If the purpose of releasing the software is to make it as widely used as possible, it, you don't always, you can't always put an open source license on it. The, in a climate, when I released um, Stronghold, two very important factors existed which made it impossible for Stronghold to be an open source product. Um, one was the export controls in the United States, which <clears throat> required that we set up a development office outside the United States in the UK and all development had to take place in the UK and all contributions had to be tightly controlled. That was the advice our lawyers gave us. It is possible to do free software projects in an open source fashion and there's different ways of doing it, but in that case our attorneys told us that we needed to tightly control who is contributing to the product and in order to do that, we had a proprietary software development effort going on in the UK. Second to that, in order for someone to deploy a cryptography application within the United States legally, 
you would have to license patents from OSA Data Security. And in order to license patents from OSA Data Security, they require that the product that you sell is not sold, uh, is not released under an open source license. So when releasing software and when trying to accomplish something, it's really important not to be ideological about the license you choose for some reason saying, oh, all software should be free, yada, yada, yada. The point, in my opinion, for software to exist is so that it can accomplish a human need, what humans need to do, not exist for the sake of existing. And can therefore, you need to release software under whatever license is the most appropriate for the context you're releasing it yeah, in. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, to, uh, to amplify that by saying that I think it's very important to take a long-term view of what you're doing as well. Uh, it's very easy to think short-term, like if I do this piece of software, it'll hurt the world. But in fact, uh, sometimes making a business t uh, deal with a company like RSA or whatever is actually a very good thing to do because it gets a particular tool out to more people. And you then raise consciousness about the need for other variations on that tool, which end up in secure banking systems that you know people can use, poor people in areas where they're not serviced by bank branches or any number of other examples of things that are useful. So yeah, yeah go ahead. Adam? Yeah, I want to call on the next one. So let, let me ask a question, because you started by saying that in Germany it's not easy to design your own career path the way it is in the US. Is it possible, I know that there, there are some companies here in Germany, SUSE Linux, um, that, that are doing things. It's also possible to work for a company in another country. I know a lot of people who do this. Um, if you can't find the company you want to work for in Germany, Reputation capital. Yeah, it, it also it doesn't have it, to be a U.S. company. It could if, be an Israeli company. It could be a Russian company. If there's something company, that you've done that's well. really cool, release it to the world so that you can take credit for it. You know, the projects that you work on in your spare time, make them available, develop a reputation, get to know the people at the company you want to work for, and then go to them and say, look, you know, I've done A, B, C, and D. I'd like a job. That's why we're here. I never yeah, said it's, it was it easy. Yeah, I, it, okay, so difficult. I work for a big company. We have labs all over the place, including one in Germany. If you want to talk to me later, maybe we can figure out how to get you some free time on all the equipment there. Yeah, actually, let me, let me, let me respond a little differently, Dave, yeah, okay, and say okay. it's difficult for everyone to establish reputation. The internet is a big place. It's hard to get people's attention. It's hard to keep it. Um, I said earlier, it's taken me eight or nine years of spending a lot of time giving away my time, giving away my energy on other people's projects so that I got to the point where I can do my own thing and get to the job that really excites me. So yes, you need to start small. It's not possible for someone who's 16 to step out of high school and create their dream job. You have to think of this as a career. That's why we're talking about career punks. Maybe you're just a late bloomer. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, you could, you, you, volunteering is an extremely important thing. I, in fact, I would, I would say that volunteering, continuing to volunteer even after you've got a job is a good thing. Yeah. Um, 
It's good to do things. Yeah, and. Yeah, man. Yeah, baby. I hear you. Yeah, yeah. You see? Yeah. <laughs> but he would appreciate a ride in one. Dave, we've got another question <laughs> down here. Yeah. The, myth of, the Mythical Man Month, yes. Excellent book. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, I, I have an action item for you, Ant. Can you write that on the message board on the refrigerator in the cypherpunk stand? So anybody here who wants to can come by and get the title of that book. Cool? All right. Also, if anybody has a question they want to ask of anybody in the Cypherpunks group, you can send email to ccc-punks, P-U-N-K-S, at cypherpunks.to. That's cypherpunks spelled C-Y-P-H-E-R-U-N-K-S, or something like that. I'm not sure. Oh, so I think at this to. point... We're, we're starting to lose people, and I'm going to yeah. suggest yeah. that we, yeah, a good time to break it up. we, the panel, will stay up here and answer any questions that anyone has. But thanks very much for coming, and we hope that we've been useful to you. Yeah, and, and we can be useful to you in other ways later on. You may not know about them yet, so Do come and talk to us. Do you want to one last question before we break? Yeah, one last question? Yes, that's, that's Tom people DeMarco's wear. books are Tom DeMarco is the author of People Wear. Great book. Good yeah, recommendation. Okay. So anyway, um, just take it really seriously that, that it's good to have a job because that gives you the opportunity to do a lot of other important stuff that, that everybody here will appreciate. So go out there and uh, if you have any questions, let us know. Thanks. Thanks.